I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. I'm here with Ryan Harrell to revise, recap one of my classic videos, <laughs> BL Heli 100% Explained. And in that video, I went through every single BL Heli option, told you what it did, and when you might want to change it. And I've been meaning to do that for BL Heli 32 for a long time, but BL Heli 32 has a lot more options, and that's why I've called Ryan you in here to help me. <laughs> But that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to go through every BLH32 option, tell you what it does, and when you might want to change it. Let's Stay tuned. It. The first thing I want to show you in this video, I just learned today, and that is that if you've ever downloaded BL Heli Suite before, then you have probably been pretty sketched out by the website <laughs> they hosted on. It's a media fire. It's lots of spam ads. And you might, you a lot of people, well, I'm sure a lot of people actually accidentally install spam and viruses. <laughs> And other people are like, is this really the real site? No, this can't be. They have started hosting it on Google Drive officially. Yeah. Um, the 4712 or 4721, whatever his his handle is, um, posted it up on his Google Drive. So you can... That's that's so, the unofficial blog site. No, that's the official, that's the official site, official, the WordPress site. Right. Yeah, their official you, site is a WordPress site. It, it, there was a lot of confusion recently, actually, because blheli32.com was yes. a site that was that somebody had snagged right after blheli32 came out, and they were they just put a bunch of information up and were getting ads ad revenue off of it. Um, it wasn't attached to blheli at all, um, uh, the actual devs. Um, so that site recently was hacked. So like, and it's it's gone now basically. So wow, um, <laughs> everybody was complaining. Where's the BL Holly Thirty Two? Well, that's not actually their website. So you can it's... now get it. I'll put a link in the video description. You can get it off Google Drive. And as you pointed out, the cool thing about this is if you add it to your Google Drive, then mm -hmm. as they release new updates, they'll just be in your Google Drive, right? Ready to go. Yep. Super awesome. So go ahead and download BL Heli Configurator, BL Heli Suite. And if you're using BL Heli 32, you might have tried to use the Chrome app. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work with BL Heli 32. It right. only works with BL Heli S and the older ones. Um, so the Chrome app, again, is also developed by a third party. It's yes. not attached directly to um, the BL Heli guys themselves. That's right. But the Android app is developed by the guy who makes BL Heli Suite. So there is there is a BL Heli configurator Android app correct. by the official. The problem is that this is a there is, is all the older BL Heli was open source. Mm -hmm. And so when someone sat down and said, BL Heli Suite's kind of clunky and hard to use, I'm going to write a Chrome app. His name was Andre Miranov. Mm -hmm. He's a Betaflight dev in addition. So there's this third-party app out there. But BL Heli 32 has digital rights management mm -hmm. encryption, mm -hmm. and it only works with official apps right. like BL Heli Suite, the Android app. And I've heard they're working on Mac, Wind Mac, right. Linux, et cetera. But the, for now, you're probably going to be using BL Heli Suite on a PC, right. and you can get it from this drive link. So let's oh, we're going to need a quad to look at these options, and this will bring us to what may be the single coolest feature of BL Heli 32, <laughs> the biggest reason to switch. There it is. You can have custom startup tones, including that's the Mario power-up mushroom. And oh, well, let's just start there. All right. So you're going to want to select the COM port that says STM32 uh, like or STM Electronics Virtual Com port. That's going to be the, the same Com port you use for Betaflight Configurator. Correct. So um, you're going to go ahead and click Connect. And Good. then it connects. Then if you click Check over here, then it's going to populate out, boop, and mm -hmm. it'll tell us some really important. So immediately right here, there's actually something new um, that shows up in this that uh, that was added. I think it's also in BL Heli, uh, six, uh, the BL Heli S, the 16-bit one. But... Um, this is newish, maybe since the last time you did your video, I don't know, but it shows the D-Shot frames, good and mm -hmm. bad. Um, that's super useful. So if you have a question about if D-Shot uh, is having issues, if frames are getting dropped, um, if, if things are, are having trouble uh, there, it will show you right here when you connect whether you have and, a bad signal. And what you could do, I've thought about how you could use this. Let's say you've got an ESC, it says it supports D-Shot 1200, but you suspect maybe mm -hmm. something's not quite right, or you're just curious like mm -hmm. us. Go fly a pack. Right. Don't just do it on the bench because there's not going to be any electrical mm -hmm. noise. Fly a pack. Don't unplug. Right. Land. Plug into your laptop. Connect to BL Heli. And it'll show you how many good and bad. And if you see a lot of bad frames, then maybe go down to D-Shot 600 and see if it gets better. Yep. At the end of the day, I mean, as long as your quad's flying okay, <laughs> you're probably happy. But that is good troubleshooting information. Sure. So now that it's connected, um, we get all of this information here. And this is where it gets. Okay. So since I promised, let's <laughs> start with the music editor. And you click music editor here. And you can now, 
the question you, this is the music that it's going to play mm -hmm. and it's musical notes and wh what I do is as a YouTube channel where a guy makes these themes and you could just go to his YouTube channel I'll put a link in the video description or we can we can pull it up here BL Heli music basically you just copy those notes out of the out of <laughs> there it is. you copy them out of the description of his video and paste it in here and write it to all your ESCs and I'll see everyone needs a little toto <laughs> in their life and actually He's got him. He's got it for all four of the motors. I'm pretty sure for most of them. No, this is different. For many of them, the uh, the motors all have the same. And you just copy the same text mm -hmm. to each motor. This one actually looks polyphonic, so yeah. he's making chords yeah. with the individual motors. So, what you're gonna do is for each of the motors, you're gonna paste the stuff in. You need to turn music on. You need to set the gen length and gen interval to match. See, he says set gen in length nine, gen interval zero. You're going to paste it for each of the four ESCs here. And then actually you can also, uh, you can save it. Oh, you know what I need to do? Here's what I need to do. I need to type a name here. So this right. is, if I type Mario Power Up Mushroom and yeah, I hit save, save. Yep. that's going to save it to your hard drive. And then when you build a new quad or get new ESCs, you can easily just select, you don't have to go to his YouTube channel and, and copy it. You just hit that and you hit apply music. And then when you do write setup, it'll write it to the ESCs, and your mm -hmm. ESCs will make startup, startup tones, and that's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Okay. Rather than go in a random order, I think we should – I want to start with the stuff that most people are going to care the sure. most about. I would argue that PWM frequency is a good place to start. Sure. We can start there. Tell us about PWM frequency. So um, – this is one that can cause a bit of confusion because some people, when they think PWM, they're thinking the input signal, um, especially, you know, back in the day we were doing, you know, one shot, multi shot, all of that were, were derivatives of what they call centerline PWM um, or um, technically it's pulse position modulation, but it's all people called it PWM. So um, what what's happening now is we're talking about with PWM frequency, the communication between the microcontroller that's powering the ESC that's driving the ESC and the FETs or the gate drivers themselves. So it's basically controlling how often it's sending updates to the FETs. So when we're talking about PWM, we have two things that we're talking about. We're talking about duty cycle and frequency. Mm -hmm. So duty cycle tells us what percentage of the time the FET is turned on mm -hmm. and frequency tells us how often it's updating that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's basically the period that the length of time that it's that it's using to calculate the percentage and then duty cycle being the percentage. So the PWM frequency here is telling you how fast it's sending updates to the fence. How, how fast and how often the ESC is basically driving the motor. Right. And the default PWM frequency in Beale Heli suite is 24 kilohertz, mm -hmm. but I'm running at 48 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. And I do that for all of my quads. I mm -hmm. start at 48K. I've found that 48K can solve mid-throttle oscillations. Mm -hmm. yep. The first thing I do if you're having mid-throttle oscillations is I say start at 48K and then work your way down in steps from 48 to 24. It's not always the case that higher is better. Right. Higher also often gives smoother motors at higher throttle. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about some – so as a, as a rough guideline, I would say – on every build you do, set the set the PWM frequency to 48k, mm -hmm. and then if, see how that flies. If yeah. you really want to dig into it, you can experiment. And you'll hear an audible difference when you're driving it at higher frequencies. The whole motor will sound a little bit smoother. It will sound a little bit softer sounding when mm -hmm. it's when it's running. What are some reasons not to just set it to? Why do they default to 24 instead sure. of 48 then? So. Um, the older ESCs, the the BL Heli 16, um, were often running at 16 kilohertz. That was kind of the the midpoint that they were running at. Um, the problem that you run into is that that's within the standard. Also, in in terms of when ESCs are driving the motor, every time it pushes the uh, you know pushes the motor around one, mm -hmm. it's called a commu commutation. So each time it's driving one phase to the next phase, that's called a commutation. Mm -hmm. So what what happens is when your commutation frequency 
is kind of aligning with the PWM update frequency, that's when you get oddness around mid throttle oscillations. There's so a, it's, there's it's an actually aliasing it's problem, an, right? It's an aliasing around that that issue. So by moving it to higher frequency, you're moving that to a higher RPM range, yeah. which typically has less trouble with it because it's happening quicker, and often it will actually move it outside of the range at which the ESC is operating. So that's why 48 kilohertz is pretty much the least likely chance for that to happen unless you're running super tiny motors. Um, you know, what kind of what kind of problems? What kind of problems could you run into it, if you set it at 48k? Why might you sure. not want to do that? So there's there's a known issue with driving at higher PWM frequencies when you're dealing with um, brushless motors, and that has to do with low end torque. Um, because you're you're updating more frequently, it 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 changes the relationship between how much current is passing through at very, very low um, duty cycles. Um, because you're updating so frequency, so frequently and the duty cycle is so low, um, it can actually reduce the, the spinning torque at very low um, RPMs. Okay. So your low end might feel a little bit softer. Um, okay. You might, it might, um, you might notice that you have to use a little bit higher throttle at very low throttle to maintain a certain cruising point. Um, for instance, if you if you're used to cruising at a certain throttle percentage on BLHS, mm -hmm. you may find that when you switch to BLHS 32, you're using a little bit higher throttle percentage to cruise at a slow speed um, for the same speed. Now that that difference dissipates as you move higher in the throttle because um, the duty cycle is taking up more of the percentage of the right. drive cycle and and even at higher frequencies it's still pushing and then obviously at um, at full throttle the the FETs are essentially open the entire right the entire uh, frequency so it doesn't it doesn't really matter at all at full throttle so so I my my philosophy has been that a higher PWM frequency usually solves more problems than it causes. Yeah. And I, the other thing I've heard is that on some of the early BLHA32 ESCs, the processor like wasn't running fast enough, and the higher PWM frequency would cause an issue. Right. They couldn't I, actually drive it at much higher. Than, I don't than think that, that's yeah. really an issue today. No. Right. So I would say, as a shorthand, just mm -hmm. go to forty-eight k, especially if you're having mid-throttle oscillation mm -hmm. issues. Change that around. Sure. Okay. Um, one of the, one other thing relating to the PWM frequency um, has to do with the resolution of the timers on the processor itself. Okay. So it's not just the speed of the processor; it has to do with how much resolution the PWM, the hardware PWM drivers, can actually output. So it has to do with the number of steps of resolution that you're capable of driving it at. So sometimes at um, different PWM frequencies, you may have a different effective resolution. Hmm. Um, you know, some may be 1024 steps, um, depending on, so as you go up in, in frequency. You may, you may lose a tiny bit of throttle resolution. Right. Maybe, but if you went from a difference of 1024 steps to a difference of say 512 steps. Right. Are de debatable whether that's um, or noticeable. twenty forty eight to twenty forty eight to ten twenty four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, depending on how that that um, timer is provisioned, you could you could lose some resolution there um, depending okay. on what you select. But um, that's probably right. not going to be dramatically noticeable. Um, the only point would be that D shot has a certain resolution, and then the PWM driver output has a certain resolution. So even if D shot has a high resolution, you may not be experiencing the full resolution of D shot. Uh, at, at because the PWM frequency is is basically yeah. nullifying. I espe I especially think this is useful for freestyle pilots who want smoothness at high throttle. Mm -hmm. And again, to solve them, this is one of the biggest reasons I people ask: Should I go to BL Heli thirty two or can, I can get an eight dollar race day quads <laughs> BL Heli S E S C or a Zylo? Get, Luminear has or get FPV has a mm -hmm. Zylo. Mm -hmm. It's like eight bucks is BL Heli S, and this is one of the biggest reasons I think people should go to BL Heli 32 because BL Heli S doesn't give you the option to adjust this parameter, and it can solve some pretty. It's really hard to solve mid throttle oscillations with PID tuning or filtering. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this really clears it up. Okay, let's move on. The next one I think people are curious about and want to know if they should tweak it is probably timing, motor timing. Sure. sure. So. Can we get a can we get a like a one minute description of what motor timing is? Because we could do a I'll whole video on motor timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so motor timing has to do with how far in advance of when the magnet is crossing that peak point in the stator, mm -hmm. the um, the ESC actually opens the FETs. So it's trying to predict at what point that what's called the zero crossing happens. So the the higher the timing, the further in advance of that. Um, it's it's opening the FETs. The longer the FETs are on during the transition phase, mm -hmm. and so the more current is pushed through the stators, um, the higher the torque as a result because current and torque are directly proportional. So it just it's basically it's it's burning more energy 
and creating more torque at the cost of, or, or you know, at the cost of energy. Here's, here's the analogy. Tell me if you like this analogy or if it's completely off base. Imagine that you are a parent and your kid is on one of those mm-hmm. merry-go-rounds and you're going to reach out, you're going to grab the bar and you're going to sling it, mm-hmm. right? With a higher timing, you're sort of reaching, you're grabbing the bar sooner and pulling sooner. Yeah. And With then, a lower yeah. timing, you're, you're kind of grabbing the bar here and you're just going. <laughs> right, right. But there's more to it than the, the physical spacing. It has to do with like how fast the FETs open up. Right. With, with slower yep. FETs, you might need to open the FETs sooner, mm-hmm. etc. There's yeah, a lot going on there. And it has to do with how long it takes the current to propagate through the coil. The coil. Which is yeah. impacted by impedance and a lot of other factors. So resistance of the coil, all of those things, the... the S- all of the like a, a low resistance coil is gonna is gonna be okay with um, with uh, lower timing than than a higher resistance coil that takes longer to spin up. But there's there's a lot of factors involved. Even the magnet strength plays a role because um, it has to do with how you know how quickly the magnet is reacting to the coil. So there's there's lots of factors in there. Generally speaking, you're safe you're safer going higher mm-hmm. than not going higher because. Okay. A higher timing is inherently more resistant to desync than a lower timing. So, so it's basically it's better to 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 overshoot on timing than to undershoot. Here's one of the points I like to make about timing. If you if you go to some areas like if you're running really unusual motors, mm-hmm. or if it, it, in the old days when ESCs were not as capable as they are today, you would have a desync and you would change the timing and it would fix the desync. Right. I feel really confident that if you're getting desyncs on really any like five inch, six inch typical mm-hmm. mini quad motor, something's broke. You right. don't, you're not going to fix that. The timing makes a difference in the motor's performance, mm-hmm. but it shouldn't make a difference of whether the motor does or doesn't spin. If your motor doesn't spin, right. it's probably broke. What effect does changing timing have? Going, you said going to high timing is less likely to create desyncs. Mm-hmm. It also increases torque a little bit, increases power. Um, I've run back-to-back tests on, on my thrust stand, like just changing um, a couple of pr- uh, parameters, and we'll talk about one of the others here in a little in a okay. little bit. But um, increasing timing always increases power. Um, and and amps. Right, so and amps. So it's decreasing efficiency a little bit, increasing power a little so bit. So should racers always basically run high timing? I wouldn't – see, high – running high doesn't really gain you anything – uh, like you see more gains going from mid range to like middle high. Yeah. Like what and the, in the default days, is. Me- I think the default high. is like 15 degrees. Yeah. But we could turn it up, and that's higher. So timing. 31 is is pushing it. I I generally recommend around 23 to 25. You start getting above 25, and you're seeing more efficiency loss without really a corresponding right. gain. Um, 20 23 24 is a good middle point. It gives you a good. A range of power without sucking a whole ton of amps, um, now, and at at the highest timing points, you also run a little bit more of a risk of if the motor gets blocked. Um, you know, you hit something, motor stops spinning while it's still being driven. Right. You run more risk of burning the motor or burning the ESC because it's dumping more current right. into those coils. So, and that's what makes it burn. So, right. like, just a little bit more resilience by going down to 24 without a whole lot of loss in power. In, you know, now the default, I think, is 15, although I'm not 100% 16, sure. 16. 16. That makes sense. If 31 remember. is the max, right. 15, 16. Is there any reason you said turning it down might make desyncs more likely? Right. I would never turn it down. Never like, turn no, it down. Unless you're running large multipole, like, you know, motors. The, the, right. the only reason to turn it down is if you're running a different type of environment from a mini quad. Like, right. Okay. Basically, okay. any mini quad, I, I just automatically set it to 23 or 24 on every build. And I run, and if you turn it down here, all the way to the bottom, it gets to auto. Now, what's auto timing? So, auto timing will basically use the back. Uh, EMF mm-hmm. to try to predict the timing, um, and because here's here's the thing that that it was not acknowledged a lot except mm-hmm. by motor d- engineers and stuff. The optimal timing isn't one fixed value. It's right. different it's, at different as the motor spins correct. faster, the timing can change because mm-hmm. it's physically moving faster, correct. and you can. And so, uh, t- so auto timing will try to like detect the right mm-hmm. timing for each RPM value that the motor's actually at. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So. I, I mean, you, you could kind that. of compare it a little bit of uh, to um, custom tunes in your engine control unit in your car. Love so it. if you like, auto would be kind of the stock tune. Like it's going to try to make the best prediction for the shift points in the car. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever it's going to it's going to make that prediction and try to make that work. Um, the th- 
it's going to be more efficient than mm -hmm. manually setting the timing, and it's it's going to give you kind of a, a, a good middle ground. It's going to try and shoot for that that ideal point. Mm -hmm. What it's not going to do is going to give you the most power. So, right. um, and it's also not going to help you if you get into a desync situation, like because it's going to like the auto algorithm can can really get kind of confused. confused if you right. like if you smack a branch or stop a prop suddenly right right then. so i always run auto because i think that auto timing for a freestyle pilot who cares more about smoothness mm -hmm. than power i think auto timing is 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 similar to pwm frequency in that it can solve some of the issues that mm -hmm. give you a little bit of jello or a little bit of vibration i haven't done a whole lot of testing to prove that do you do you, am i am i on the right track or am um, i just imagining it I, I don't – again, I don't have a lot of data to, to back that up. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that you do get reduced power by running auto time. I, I, so yeah. you – like it could be, you know, 3 or 4% reduction in power output. So a racer is going to want to take your advice to run maybe 24 degrees sure. timing. Maybe a freestyle pilot can try auto or maybe I'm just losing power with no benefit. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I just automatically set it to 23 because that's what I've always done. Okay. Me medium high was what I always ran back in the day. And I, okay. I, haven't, I haven't really seen any gains from running auto mm -hmm. myself, but that doesn't mean they're not there. That's why, I'm, that's why I love you. Let's do uh, DMAG compensation sure. next. What is DMAG compensation? So DMAG compensation has to do with um, how it handles uh, – we, we talked a little bit about the zero crossing, so how it handles missed zero crossings. So DMAG compensation will try to detect when it misses the zero, com the zero crossing and it basically um, will adjust things like timing and, and some other things like control uh, how um, the, the duty cycle that, it, that it's allowing the, the – um, the FETs to be driven at and reducing that duty cycles to kind of back off the power a little bit um, to prevent it from going into a desync situation. So it's detecting it's detecting those missed zero crossings and it's trying to compensate for them. Yeah, the, the zero crossing, to go back to the merry-go-round analogy, if you think about that merry-go-round, you grab the bar, you're pulling the bar, mm -hmm. and then as it crosses your body, you're pushing the bar, right. and you need to switch from pulling to pushing. If you were to stick your arm out and push, it would it will break your arm and that's a right. desync. So in, in terms of brushless motors, um, basically a brushless motor only pushes and as soon as it hits that zero crossing, it has to let go. Right. So if it misses the zero crossing and it doesn't let go, then it's going to, that causes real problems because then it's pulling now it's the it's pulling direction. the motor and right. Yeah. So, and well, we'll talk more about that in okay. a little bit, but. So it needs to detect the zero crossing because it needs to keep the timing of the pulling and the pushing all mm -hmm, correct mm -hmm. so the motor doesn't break mama's arm as she's trying to right. swing that merry-go-round when the zero crossing is missed dmag compensation basically the motor kind of i like to think of it like it goes into a very conservative state as it drives the motor mm, right it reduces the power mm -hmm. but it reduces the odds of a desync right so by setting this to off we not doing anything we it's basically not detecting it. if we get a missed zero crossing we're going to get a desync the quad's going to fall out of the air it's no good um, I mean, you can survive several missed zero crossings. It has to be an extended period of, of it freaking out before it's a problem. Okay. Um, so, like, I, I I don't remember exactly. I talked to the devs at one point about this, but it, there's a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you're changing when you right. change from low to high is, like, how, to what degree is it is it freaking out when, like, saying, okay, we need to back power so, down. So with low and high, with, with low and high, basically what you get, I think – do you get a in general a reduction in power across the board even when no, no. nothing bad is happening? If nothing bad is happening, it shouldn't make any difference at all. Okay, it's only changing the degree to which it reacts. So when then, why it don't we something. why don't we just run high and give ourselves the maximum protection against desyncs? I honestly haven't been able to tell a major difference between low and high. And again, okay. some you have to remember some of these settings in BL Heli are designed for different applications than what we're using. Right um, on bigger motors, it's going to matter a whole lot more. I remember hearing from people who, as we were getting into six. Success before success was more popular. That if you're running success, especially higher KV motors, you want to run high DMAG yeah, composition. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I guess the thought there is that you're more likely to, because of electrical noise in the system mm -hmm. or whatever, to miss the zero crossings. And you want to make sure that you're compensating and for that. I don't. I also, don't know. if if you're talking about BL Heli um, S early days before modern times. Um, We'll we'll talk about this when we get to another setting, but there were some there were some additional reasons because DMAG compensation used to include ramp up power in it. Oh, so that so was only one ramp setting. Up ramp up well. power uh, or startup power back in the day, or, or not back in the day. And BLLES startup power in BLLES 32 ramp up power, same thing, just renamed it. Mm -hmm. um, but early days of BLLES and back in BLLES um, regular BLLES. Uh, 
the DMAG compensation and ramp-up power were part of the same okay. parameter. Okay. So going to high would also change ramp-up power. So DMAG compensation, basically everybody flying a typical mini quad should leave it at low. But if you feel like setting it on high, you probably won't notice any difference. Right. In theory, high gives you better protection against desyncs. Mm. And mostly you're going to deal with high if you're using diff atypical motors. Right. Um, and again, for, for low KV, big, like yeah. UAV class motors, you, and maybe for X-Class, I haven't done much testing with X-Class, mm, but yeah. um, I would imagine that might be useful there. Okay. So ramp up power um, basically across the board controls the the change that is allowed in the duty cycle of the PWM. So it's basically saying any so, so single jump. Can, can, hang on, hold on. So the duty cycle of the PWM, could we make an analogy that that's essentially like the throttle as you, you know, you're stepping on the accelerator right. on your car. It's how long the FET is driven on per cycle of the PWM. And as previously. you raise the throttle, you get a longer on time. Right. Okay, so go ahead, ramp up so, power is? Um, it's basically limiting the degree to which the, P the duty cycle can change. So, um, Again, I, I mentioned that DMAG compensation used to include this parameter as part of it, and there was only two settings, and that was it. So now you can control the ramp-up power completely separately. And so you can reduce it dramatically, which basically only allows the FETs to change at a certain rate. Um, what's interesting, again, I did some cross-testing between ramp-up power and timing and did like a, a cross-tab where I did a mm -hmm, multivariate mm -hmm, test. Mm -hmm. and, um, and tested them with different settings and, and looked at the response times. And you can actually go fairly low on ramp up power before it actually starts really impacting the the, the actual because RPM accelerator of the acceleration of the motor. Because, because the ramp up power prevents, it limits the ability of the ESC to go from say zero throttle, boom, all the way up to like whatever. Right. But in reality, you're seldom making those giant jumps well, anyway. And here's the thing, even when you do make those jumps, it doesn't actually reduce the actual acceleration of the prop um, dramatically until you get quite low. Okay. And, w and the reason why that's happening is because there's a physical limitation on the propeller in terms of how quickly it can change RPMs. Right. So basically what you're doing is you're preventing a lot of wasted energy during the time period which the propeller is actually not accelerating because there's the moment of inertia is too high. So it reduces that insane current peak that happens oh. at the very beginning without really in slowing down the acceleration. Because as, as we all know, a stuck motor draws a ton of right. current the as the current ESC, is the stall current. And when you raise the throttle rapidly, but the prop has not accelerated yet, essentially that's where you get that current spike. So could we could we benefit from turning this down? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't able to detect any significant reduction in um, in uh, response, time. response time until I was like below twenty percent. That's going to vary a little depending on your motor. A really torquey right. motor might need more more right, right. Uh, headroom here mm -hmm. to avoid performance loss. Correct. But in theory, you would reduce those current spikes by turning this down a little mm -hmm. bit. Absolutely. Um, maybe a, maybe somebody who's running a twenty amp ESC who doesn't actually have here. more a little more likely to fry might turn that down. Yeah. So um, actually, if you go into the Data Explorer This here, is Ryan's website, miniquadtestbench.com, which you all certainly know about, but if not... <laughs> you can see in here, um, I have, if you look in the Data Explorer under mechanical delay testing, um, I have a couple of things in here. So here's, um, this is with um, Bielheli, regular old school Bielheli, okay. um, because that's the uh, ESC that I have on the bench. So this is just with startup power, not... Mm -hmm. um, not ramp up power. Okay. Uh, so that I don't know exactly how those translate, um, but uh, you can see here that um, I have high timing at 0 .3, 0 0.031, 0 0.063, 0 0.125, 0 0.5, and then I have so I have each of these tested uh, on the different timings. So high, medium, high, okay. and medium. So this is like. Um, this is like 16 degrees, this is like uh, 24 degrees, and this is like 31 degrees timing. Okay. Um, and then these are the, I don't remember exactly what the percentages translate to, but um, it's, uh, the stock on is 0.5 okay. on startup power. So I guess that's 50%. So that would be 12.5%, 6.3%, 3.1%. Okay. Um, and how do they compare? So if, for instance, if we look at medium high, which is what I would recommend, we can go ahead and add in 
all of the different timings or the different uh, startup powers in here. And um, should we also see amps so we can see the oh voltage yeah, right. spike? We need amps, probably more than RPMs. Let's go that way. There we go. Yeah. So you can see that pretty much all of them are the same until you get down here to um, 0.31. Uh huh. So, yeah. No, really, no, because we're not hitting the cap. Right. The cap, we're just not hitting it. But you can also see here that these current spikes drop off for yes. each setting. Yeah. Until like this one is really significantly dropped, but so you're seeing that current spike while the motor's not actually spinning yet. Right. But it's not really dramatically impacting that current the acceleration. Spike, and that current spike is so short, that people right. might think, oh, it's gonna you're gonna get longer battery life. No, no, no. What where I think this is gonna actually potentially make a difference is, let's say you've got a 20 amp ESC and your motors are frying it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that current spike is, right. and I'm picking on 20 amp ESCs because a lot of times the that they'll be more susceptible to voltage spikes, even though right. technically they're rated to so, the same voltage. Yeah, and I run 20 amp ESCs on some ridiculous setups. A good, setups. a well spec 20 amp ESC will do fine. But right. if you're popping ESCs, well, just go buy better ESCs. But <laughs> if you're if you want to try reducing this a little bit, that may help reduce those transient current spikes. Right. So do you change this? Do you leave this at default on all yours, or do you I have do. a value? I, I have really. It? I mean, I haven't. Again, I don't run into things that often so and there's really no reason to increase it then since most no, of the time yeah. we're not we're not hitting that limit anyway. definitely but i think you could you could probably get down to 20 percent uh, to to you know somewhere between 12 and 20 or 10 and 20 percent without causing a dramatic increase and if you have a, or decrease in handling if you have a thrust stand or if you're a racer who's doing laps very consistently you could you could compare mm -hmm. most pilots though you probably if you lower it too mm -hmm. much you'll get reduction in output power and you, right. you may not even notice the difference because you're just not that sensitive yeah, so. it's, I mean, it's not dramatic. If you look at the curve here, yeah, um, what's it, the difference in thrust? By the way, it does it does get there, right? It gets, it gets there. It, it just, just gets there slightly. Longer. How much longer does it take to get so there? That what's is, the difference? Uh, like hundred milliseconds. No, 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 is that no, right? no, no, no. Sorry, um, that's like I misread it. Microseconds. So, yes, so that's like eight milliseconds. Okay, well, that's not so, nothing. It's not nothing, not nothing, but it's not dramatic either. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, if you look at this, the, the whole the yeah. prop is taking. You know, how long does it take to get to RPM to, like, to, to a total of you know 120 milliseconds? That's a, that's so, a, that's so it's maybe 10 percent slower, five five to 10 percent slower. Yeah, that's, so that's like that's 160 something. milliseconds. To so you that definitely part there, you but definitely a acceleration happens here. Want to err on the high side, otherwise you're going to be hurting your performance right, for very with little, little gain. Okay. Um, so and. The the other thing that that can help with is again we talked about block blocked props and mm -hmm. things like that so it's going to reduce that a little bit so that um, the likelihood of blowing an ESC due to an impact um, mm -hmm. on the motor or the motor locking up is going to be lower with the lower startup power. Oh, sorry. So here's here's where I want to that that brings me to the next thing we should talk about which mm -hmm. is current protection. Mm -hmm. So current protection is another way you can protect against block props and fried ESCs. Mm -hmm. And this this came in with BLA32 ESCs that have current sensors right. in them. Basically, the ESC, since it's detecting the current anyway, right. if you go over you know, certain amps, it'll basically just clamp off and, and slow the, right. lower the throttle. Correct. Now, that's off by default, or did I turn that off? No, no it's off by default. So. And, and uh, there's an argument to, to be made for leaving it off because um, when you have current limiting uh, turned on, it, uh, it will have some impact on those acceleration points. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look here, even even with the timing reduced, we're looking at 130 amps. Just for, for a that. few right. microseconds or right. milliseconds. Right. right. This, this is, I mean, by, this is like seven milliseconds in, it's completely stabilized. Right. By four milliseconds in, it's reduced by like three quarters. That, that number, so, that, to, to you and me, that's not surprising because I think that number may surprise a lot of people. Well, that's actually more than that. That's that's like 95 milliseconds in, and that's like 30, like 40 milliseconds in. By 40 milliseconds, it's... It's down in a reasonable range. Right. That, that number may surprise a lot of people to, that the spike is 130 amps, like that, that the ESC does, doesn't immediately explode, that the battery doesn't... Because right. you've got four motors, and they're all doing this. Right. You, could, you could, for a few milliseconds at a time, pull 400 amps, yeah. potentially. But then it just drops off immediately. Right, and right. That's it just happens. It happens so fast that the battery and the ESCs don't even have time to react right. to it. So, like, 
eventually over time that will wear on your hardware. Um, and that's, you know, if you're going to have a failure due to sustained use, it's going to be a, a result of that kind of, yeah. that kind of damage over time. But it's minuscule. So turning on current protection will, will sort of edge, take the edge off those peaks. Mm -hmm. What effect does that have? like on flight performance? Uh, well, it's just going to basically reduce the maximum rate at which your propellers can change RPMs. So you, you might feel a little bit more prop wash. You might feel a little bit less snap when you do mm -hmm. instant stops and instant rolls. Um, but that's uh, if, uh, you know, I discovered this back in the day because KISS has implemented current limiting. That's right. Some Once time. again, something that KISS did first. Right. <laughs> credit where credit's so due. So it... Um, but as a result, their their acceleration curves were always much slower than the other ESCs. And that's one of the reasons I always preferred the feel of BL Heli because it's much sharper. It's much crisper. But freestyle pilots loved that. KISS. I have heard this conjecture that out. KISS ESCs were smoother because they had current limiting, which made the props respond yep. slower, yep. which sounds like a bad thing. But if you're going for smoothness, yeah. it isn't. So, um, so, so we've got current protection. We could turn it on. And I don't know. I mean, you could say – you might be tempted to say, well, I've got a 25-amp ESC. I'm going to set it at 25 amps. No, yeah. no. The ESC can handle bursts. Mm -hmm. But you could make yeah, your quad yeah. so respond a little smoother by, and protect it against overcurrent. And you can control the degree to which it smooths things out. So you could, limit, you could limit it down to like 110 amps or something like right. that, which would only – which would – you know, reduce the current peak down to something like, see, this is 103 amps. Yeah. So you can kind of predict from that what, what you're looking at for mm -hmm. this particular prop and motor combination. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's definitely, you could, you could look at, for instance, if you had a motor and a prop that I have tested, you could go to my website, mm -hmm. you could pull up that, look at the spike, see what it is and see like, well, how much do I want to reduce that? Yeah. How much do I want to risk? Um, you yeah. know, and then make your current protection limit no. based on that. Well, one thing to, to – because I've heard also from people who've turned this way down. They turn it down to like 30 or 40 amps. Mm -hmm. And what happens then, especially if you're at full throttle, you'll get a full throttle oscillation mm -hmm. because the, e the ESC hits the limit and backs off and hits the limit yeah. and backs off. So if you set this too low, you will get yourself in trouble. But mm -hmm. that's another way to protect against desyncs, protect against popping mm -hmm. ESCs if maybe your ESCs are a little cheap and maybe a little not, not the mm -hmm. strongest. Mm -hmm. Um that's another thing you can do. I guess ramp up power and current protection sort of work together. Yeah, they they're they're related. They're kind of doing just, the same thing. They're using a different mechanism to, to limit to that limit spike. It. So okay. the the ramp up power is limiting the the how long the FETs can be on for, mm -hmm. and the current protection is detecting the current and then backing off the beta. It's using the same mechanism in the end, but it's using the current as the defined point mm -hmm. instead of using just the maximum delta. As that may be why it's point. off by default. Mm -hmm. you know. Okay. The other one that ramp up power made me think of was maximum acceleration. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I maximum. Yeah. I love that. It's not like low, high, medium. <laughs> yeah, it's maximum. We right. want the maximum acceleration at maximum. What so does that do? This is a setting that we never have to mess with. It's specifically okay. geared towards large motors and commercial applications, like big motors. It, okay. It's not something Eight inch that props, will, right. 10 inch props. Right. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, or even Cause, higher, like cause, 15 inch props. Because maximum acceleration is defined in percent per millisecond, right. and it's presumably how fast the prop or motor will be allowed to accelerate. Right. It feels very similar to ramp up power. I, I guess ramp up power is how much the throttle is allowed to change. Maximum acceleration is how much the RPM is allowed to change. Um, I, I'm I'm not actually sure what mechanism they're using to measure that. Um, I talked to Stefan about it, and he's like, "You don't know." Basically, he told me you don't need to worry about okay. it. Okay, it's for motors that you don't. Uh, then you don't mini quad to. pilots just leave it at right. max. So I did. I put go. a little description of it in the article on my website here um, when I was talking about uh, brushless driving ESC basics. And again, if you want to know more, I covered a lot in, of this in detail on this article. Um, so I, again, this article was written for right those who like to read instead of listen to us talk. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> So this was this was written right after a conversation I had with the devs of BL Heli because I wanted to make sure I got everything right. Um, so if you look at um, if you look at maximum acceleration here, um, I talk about it briefly, um, but it has to do with it. Basically, it's using kV and RPMs instead of um, instead of just the PDM uh, duty cycle, okay. which is what the other the other option uses. Okay, but leave it at max and move on. Yeah. for us. All right, next. We got plenty of other things to spend our time on then. Well, okay. So, let's do some easy ones. Motor direction? Yeah. Normal. If you need to reverse your motor cuz it's spinning the wrong way, you change it to reversed. Yep. And it makes the motor spin the other way. Couple interesting trivia about that. 
Um, the way that the motor spins, number one, if you buy clockwise versus counterclockwise motors, that only refers to the direction of the threads, mm -hmm. not the way the motor will spin. The way the motor spins depends on how it's connected to the ESC and how the ESC drives it. It's actually not really, uh, I'm sure an electrical engineer could predict, but basically what we do is we just wire them up. We, wait, we see which way they spin yeah. and then reverse yeah. them if we need to. And there's an interesting uh, thing, discussion on this particular point because uh, – maybe six months a year ago, there was some people claiming that they were getting desyncs when the motors were reversed versus that. normal. But I spent an extensive amount of time talking with the devs of BLHeli and they're like, they're literally in the code, it's arbitrary. There's right. no difference between the way the motor is driven well, that's forward why it's a or reverse. No one expects it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, right. So, so like they literally, they took apart the code and they're like, no, there's nothing here that would make that happen. So yeah. um, if, if something like that happened, it was, it was... Okay. Coincidence, yeah. Not so. Then we've got bidirectional 3D. That's going to be used if you're like Zoe FPV and you you want them to be able to spin, make switch, spin, directions. switch directions in mid-flight. It's important to know that if you set them to bidirectional 3D, the zero throttle point becomes 50 percent. Yeah. So you also have to go into beta flight and enable bidirectional mode. If mm -hmm. you set the ESC to bidirectional but not the beta flight or vice versa, and bad things will happen. You can set your centered throttle percentage there and mm -hmm. you just have to make sure that that matches whatever you have set in beta flight. Right. And then there's bidirectional 3D reversed which if is, you're, right. just makes it spin the other way. And bidirectional soft. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's new. I don't remember that. Right. So that's a newer feature in the latest ones and it has to do with um, how it handles that zero when it goes between directions, mm -hmm. how it, how it handles crossing. that acceleration. So... Um, when it's not the zero crossing as in the motor crossing. No, 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 crossing, the throttle. When you're throttle going from zero, pushing right. one way to pushing the other right. way right. and the motor um, has to reverse, the motor has to like stop first, right. doesn't it? Right. Otherwise so, you'll get a desync. So it handles how that transition happens and how particularly the throttle is handled right around either side of that zero point. So, so at, soft is a little bit softer, a little bit slower. I actually am completely unfamiliar with this, but... As a 3D pilot, would you recommend people use that? I honestly, I've never tried it. I don't know. There's, okay. I know that um, the the devs added it specifically to answer some problems that some of the 3D pilots were having in certain circumstances. So there is a situation when it's applicable, but I don't know anything about. Well, when that we'll would have be. To, maybe I'll get a guest. I'll call Zoe and ask yeah. her. Okay, motor direction done. Easy. Temperature protection. Sure. Just so knock that out. That's just basically using the onboard temperature sensor in the MCU to, to let you know if... What uh, does it do when you get over 140 It just C? limits the throttle. So it's basically okay. limiting how much power is it's, it's able to output. So if the temperature keeps rising, eventually it will cut the power, mm -hmm. but it goes through like a staged thing where it will reduce. And if okay. the temperature doesn't reduce, then it reduces further yeah. until it finally will cut a off. A lot of the ways, a lot of the times when you smoke a FET, well, I don't know about a lot, but sometimes when you smoke a FET, I've heard of them getting so hot that they literally the, the, the solder, solder melts. Yeah. Yep. And then the FET moves and you get a short. Yep. So in theory, temperature protection should fix that. I mm -hmm. don't mind. I don't really mess with this. I guess you could. I mean, I electronics are really perfectly long. happy at 100, 140 C. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a good. I mean, that's hot, but it's actually not that hot for electronics. I just leave it there. And right. frankly, you're, you're flying in 70 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour airflow. They shouldn't be getting that hot. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they're be bare, usually in, if, the, if the, everything is spec'd properly. They're not going to get above lukewarm. Like, yeah. They shouldn't be hot when you come down. Low voltage protection, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, yeah. This is more used in like airplanes. airplanes. Right. With a quadcopter. Don't do it. <laughs> if, if, if the voltage drops and the ESC shuts down, you're losing the quad. With an airplane, if the voltage drops and the prop stops, you can still right. glide at home, right? On a quad, never turn on low voltage <laughs> right. protection. Just kill your battery, but get your quad home. Right. Right. Um, but you could set the, low, the voltage. Mm -hmm. I guess it's... Uh, why is it four volts and not fourteen volts? Is that per cell? It's per cell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. D just but don't just leave it. As, just kill the battery, but get the quad yeah. home. All so right. um, related to that is a little RPM power protect. Yes. And again, that has to do specifically with large uh, stator size low KV motors. Not an issue with our mini quads at all. Okay. Um, it's specifically like again. It is maybe, on though. Maybe X class. Right. It, it needs to be on. Um, it's. It's on. You're going to want to turn it off for some of those higher okay. motors. What does it do? So um, basically, it limits the amount of of um, current that can be dumped into the coils during that initial that initial like super right. low RPM stuff. But our quads never hit a low enough RPM for that to matter. Oh, because when the motor's at low RPM and you're trying to accelerate it, especially if you have a very big, massive motor with a heavy prop, 
it's like a stuck prop right. and you'll get these big amp spikes. And you have to remember that the way ESCs function, they rely on the motor actually moving right. in order to detect where it is. Well, our ESCs, phase. if you have censored motors right. like if you have on censored, RC it cars, yeah. But this is specifically related to the fact that these are uncensored ESCs and with very large motors that are moving at very slow RPMs, that can that can have issues. Okay, so, so we leave it on and we yeah, don't mess for, with it. For, for okay. us, it's not, a, not important. Oh, I see, because with a very big motor, you want to let the bigger current spike through, otherwise the motor won't even start running. Right, right. So with a big motor, the ESC would go, whoa, 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 something's wrong here, and back off. Right. With these little mini quad motors, if you ever get into a point where you're dumping a lot of current into it, it means there's a problem, right. and we need to back off. Right, right. And I think, I've always imagined that this protects against things like stuck props in a tree. Yeah, you're I, trying I to You're so. trying to shake it out of the tree, and the motor's going, no, 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 no. And it, it, the ESC is like, all right, um, forget this. Again, I, I didn't ask them a lot about the mechanics of this when I was talking okay. with them because it, they said basically, yeah, it's it's really specifically designed for, so it needs to for be large motors that have a harder time starting up at lower RPMs. Okay. Basically, they said if um, on the big motors with large props, if low RPM power protect is on, it will never start. Right. It just It'll won't, just always it won't start protect. spinning. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We're, we're actually getting through this. Uh, let's see what we got here. Current sense calibration. That's right. So that yeah. was originally there wasn't that feature wasn't there, right. and th that was one that was requested repeatedly because um, there are little variations in the resistance of the right. of the of the shunt resistor and things like that that can impact current sensing. So having it hard coded at a specific value. Right. is only so, so good. The, the BL Heli thirty two ESCs pretty much all of them nowadays have current sensors mm -hmm. on them. The current sensor is calibrated from the factory, but it's not like hand calibrated. They just, they buy a whatever 0 0.05 right. ohm, whatever, milliohm, micro, I don't know. They buy a resistor at a certain value. They solder it on there. They program mm -hmm. the ESC, but the value is not right. consistent. And you can tweak this. But here's what I've always wondered. Betaflight will give you the amps, the total amps, the sum. Mm -hmm. Right. But if your amps are off by whatever, 5%, yeah, you could take all your ESCs down by 5%. Just by doing this, but what if one ESC is off by five percent and the others are dead <laughs> on? So you really would well, need to from the one window you can the see the individual yeah amp draws. So you uh, would you power would, and battery yeah. In so beta you flight. would just run up the motors and then look at that and yeah, anybody got time really for that? To. Yeah. <laughs> so, Here's yeah. what you could do if you're really a masochist, because I don't like spinning the motors because it's a weight such on, a hassle. Put a weight on it to, as a load. And you could that would work. Yeah, because then at least you're not spinning a prop. Right. <laughs> what I do is I use the, the milliamp hours in to, and out. Right. I charge a battery to full, I, mm -hmm. and then I run so many, run it down to you know so many milliamp mm -hmm. hours, and then I charge it back up again, and I compare the milliamp hours right. out to in. That gets you pretty close, and you don't have to deal with spinning props. Right. You could theoretically do that using the motors tab. You spin the motor, Just one motor it, at a yeah. time. Let it run. <laughs> you you let it run, and then you see, but just don't. Do <laughs> anyway, um, so the auto telemetry feature yeah, here is off and on is a is a useful thing because um, a lot of guys, particularly on some flight controller and ESC combinations where the ESC is using an analog current sensor, mm -hmm. not not the D shot current sensor, um, and it's feeding analog signal back for current sensing to the flight controller. Um, some flight controller and ESC combinations don't have an appropriate. Uh, um, uh, capacitance on that line hmm. and D shot because D shot is also is happening very it's fast. It's a digital protocol. And it also has very sharp corners on yeah. the signal. It can create weird noise that, that propagates to other signal lines. It basically makes the analog current sensing Freak be out. freaking right. out. So it basically it's insufficient bypass capacitance. So you can solve that by adding a bypass capacitor, like a just a 0.1 microfarad um, bypass cap soldered across the, the current sense to the ground connection will will okay. alleviate that largely, but not everybody wants to do that. So you can solve the problem by running multi-shot and then just turning auto telemetry on. What so does if you auto turn auto telemetry do? on, it'll just automatically, so normally the, the telemetry relies on D-shot sending a request packet oh. to, trigger the D, to trigger the telemetry send. Okay. So auto telemetry says, I'm just gonna automatically send every so often. So, so this then, is the, then that w the FC doesn't the flight controller doesn't have to request the telemetry. The correct. ESC just sends it. Correct. Even if you're using multi shot, you right. can then use ESC telemetry. Right. Wow. So uh, there is some weirdness with you, like I, I haven't worked it out completely. Where um, possibly if you have all four ESCs with auto telemetry turned on, I was going to say because I do something. Normally, weird, all four ESCs go to the same UART. 
Right, it's, it's still and then, would be that way. And then the flight controller right. pulls them one at a time. So this may not work if you're if you're using um, if you're using multiple ESCs. I think it really is designed particularly for airplanes oh, that want, okay. to, want to get D-shot telemetry. So mini quad pilots would probably never use yeah, this. Yeah, I don't know. I tried it. I'm not it. sure if we even could. I tried it with... Um, oh, hang on. I knew this was going to happen. I lost the battery. That's okay. We still got oh. we still got the desktop recording, but I got to get another battery. So we were talking about auto telemetry. Right. So with auto telemetry, um, it can cause issues if you have multiple ESCs going at the same time with auto telemetry on. I was able to get it to read some telemetry data with all four ESCs and with all four yes. ESCs doing auto telemetry, but um, like I couldn't get the current data and some of the other yeah. data out of it. So, okay. but I was able to get like voltage data and, and a few other things. So okay. you could try it, see if it works, but I think it's generally designed for where you have one ESC. Um, in, in the environment and getting telemetry data off of that. So for instance, if I wanted to use a BL Heli ESC on my test bench and just pull data from one ESC driving one motor, right. I wouldn't have to use D-Shot. Right, you could I use multi-shot. I could just use multi-shot and then read the, the D-Shot packets off of it. So. Okay, great. Uh, sign modulation mode. This is a new one. Right, it's new It's it's new, and it's still technically beta. I would, den jet, unless you're willing to risk your stuff and like okay. experiment, I would leave it off. Um, but basically, um, the way we talked briefly about commutations and how the the ESC pushes the motor around basically um, from phase to phase. So the default way it does that is is through a basically a simulated sine wave with mm -hmm. uh, it's called trapezoidal this is drive. Probably over on your on your website, yeah. isn't it? Where yeah. Is it? Where is it? Um, so this is a great this is a great picture of it here. So this is what our ESCs are basically doing normally. Mm -hmm. So they're they're basically turning on off on off on off, and they're simulating a sine wave right. uh, through trapezoidal um, through a trapezoidal uh, method. So sine wave actually is using a, a, a simulated. It's still not purely sine. We can't. It's obviously a digital microcontroller. Right. We can't completely create a sine wave. It's a much higher resolution sine right. wave. Right. Right. So it's it's basically attempting to to drive that in a more sinusoidal pattern instead of just just alternating the the phases directly. So do, what does that does that make more efficiency? Does it make smoother running motors? Yes. Uh, in both cases, it can it can make it more efficient. Um, so there. It, it, it also may reduce power slightly and it has a little bit of trouble with high RPMs. Oh. So, um, in fact, I believe what, um, what BL Heli is doing in sine wave is technically a hybrid sine mm. drive. Yeah. So they're using sine for low RPMs, but when it, oh. when it gets towards higher RPMs, it morphs, like it kind of transitions softly into tra into trapezoidal drive um, hmm. at the higher RPMs to avoid the higher RPM issues, but it still gets the gains of efficiency and smoothness um, at the low RPMs. That's interesting. So, so beta feature, try it if you want, maybe get smoother motors at low yeah. RPM, maybe reduction in throttle, maybe your quad will fall into a lake. <laughs> it could be. Um, <laughs> and it should theoretically reduce some of those mid-throttle oscillations as well because it's oh, going to be a little well, bit that's good. I'm always Mid-throttle oscillations are so hard to solve. I'm always looking yeah. for new ways to solve so, them. So, um, there's one additional mode called field-oriented field control. Mm -hmm. So it's like basically there's that's the trapezoidal is the most basic, sinusoidal is kind of a little bit more complicated, and the end result is field-oriented control. Right. So that's where like it's taking into account all kinds of things and it has to that's, be tuned. That's the thing the Rotorite guys saw when they went to the University of Pittsburgh and the, they showed how you could the motor knows the ex the ESC knows the exact right. position of the prop. You could have props that literally interleave. Right. And the ESCs would just prevent them from right. interfering. I don't yep. know what the point of it's, that well, is. It's, but it's basically using a vector to right. drive the motor instead of um, everything else. But the problem is that that has to be tuned for each motor and propeller and everything. So, like the moment of inertia changes, it can screw up the whole thing. It has to be tuned like a, it has its own like PID controller essentially. Ugh. Ugh. So that's it's, all we need is another PID controller. Well, right, and it works for things like um, DJI where they control the entire power system. Right, and they know every aspect of it, and they can tune it from the factory, and it's good and they don't have to touch it again because it's done. Yeah. So for, for something where we're changing motors, changing props, you know, we're throwing different okay. things but on there But sign all the time. modulation, we might, if you, if you want right. to try it, try it. Okay. Um, let's see. We're good here. We did this whole column. Let's get these out of the way. Min throttle, max throttle. Sure. That's used to calibrate the endpoints. If you're running multi-shot, one shot, then you go through ESC mm -hmm. calibration. There's a video I have about how to do it. However, 
We're not going to go into that too much because if you're running DSHOT or any yeah, of the digital protocols, they have no effect whatsoever. Mm. Some people, there's a myth out there that says, oh, if, even if you're running DSHOT, real quick, enable multi-shot and, and calibrate. calibrate. I has, mean, this, I, this I always go in and manually set it to the, the typical range no, just no. in case. Nope, nope. No, no, you're, not You're for propagating that. the myth. I'm not propagating you're the propagating myth. I'm saying <laughs> just in case I need to switch to multi-shot and I don't want to have to go through the recalibration procedure. Okay. That's Okay, that's I, fair. Like, I don't care about the myth. But All I'm saying is that, like, I always set it anyway just be, so I don't have to go back and fix okay. it if I want to experiment with something later on. Fair enough. Fair enough. If, if you're I'm in there already, I might as well just. If you're going to run multi shot or one shot or any analog protocol, go through the calibration process. Right. It'll set the values automatically. Though I wouldn't necessarily just tweak them. Oh, I don't even bother calibrating. I just set them. You know the value. I, yeah, I just I do just... ten sixteen on the low end and two thousand four on the high end, and it's good. Okay, don't do that. Just run the calibration. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And then center throttle is only really relevant if you're if doing you do, bi-directional because yeah, the ESC enable. doesn't know yep. what center throttle is. Okay. So we can yeah. talk about these briefly. Break on um, stop. So. Oh, there's it's a percent now. Yeah, it's, oh, it's I, interesting. I thought it was on off. Yeah. Okay, I, break I on step. That. So a, tell them what break on step does. There's two different methods of braking that happen. And this actually goes back to your analogy of the mm -hmm. merry-go-round. Yeah, yeah. So um, the damped mode, which is also known as complementary PWM in the okay. Sam and K days, and, mm -hmm. and it really complementary PWM is a more accurate um kind of picture of what it's be actually called doing. Damped light right. is another so, thing and, it was called. Right. Or braking. Or active it's braking. It's known. all or yeah. So all of that plays plays into into each other. But um, basically, what it's doing is when it uh, normally when it's detecting the zero crossing, it's firing ahead and then stopping at the zero crossing. Mm -hmm. So in complementary PWN, it waits for the zero crossing and then fires. And that basically, instead of driving the motor, drags it. Right. Right. So it's basically pulling in the opposite direction. Effectively pulling. Basically, what's it do, what it's doing is turning the motor into a generator. Yeah, a generator. And, so and it actually backfeeds current through the system. And it's exactly what Tesla does when you're braking right. you have, and, and it's charging the regenerative braking. Right. Now, many people hear that and they think, oh, by turning this on, I'm going to get longer <laughs> flight times. The amount of current. Yeah, when you have a 3,000-pound car do, doing regenerative braking, you generate a lot of energy. Right. Your prop, it slow. The advantage is that it slows the prop down way, way faster. Way faster. Props can spin up really quickly, and it used to be like, especially mm -hmm. an old quadcopters. Remember how bad yaw was? Right. As soon as you yaw, the quad would go because <laughs> the down, the down spinning prop was a lot yeah. slower than yep. the up spinning prop with damped light. So, or, you know, active braking was probably the most significant develop in ESCs. You have to have it. In ESCs you have to ever. Have it. Um, it so, made a huge difference. And that's why here we have non-damped mode. The default with BL Heli 32 is that damp light braking is always on. Right. They actually didn't even used to let you turn it off, but right. now you can, although I don't know why you would. A lot of people are using BL Heli 32 ESCs on airplanes. Okay. So if you're so, running airplanes, you turn it off. Yeah. You turn, you turn non-damped mode on, which is turning braking off. For mini right. quads, this is always off, off right. which means braking is on. Right. But then what is brake so, on stop? And that's where a lot of people get confused. So this is where the second the second type of braking kicks in. Mm -hmm. So basically what the ESC can do is it can essentially open the FETs just across the board mm -hmm. and like short circuit it. And you can simulate this. You can feel the effect mm -hmm. of this. Take a tweezers or a pliers or something and touch the two uh, motor wires to get short them together. Yeah, and you, then try to spin and the try motor. and spin and your motor. Like, you want to don't do that. Don't do that when your battery's plugged in, you <laughs> numbskulls. When your battery is unplugged, just take something metal, touch on your four in one ESC or on your regular ESC, short circuit the three motors, and try and turn, and you'll yeah. get a bunch yeah. of resistance. It'll be hard to turn. Yeah. It's kind of cool. So basically, it opens the high side, the the side of the FETs that are facing the um, the the motor and lets them connect so that it it instantly stops the motor from spinning. I mean, it's like yeah. dead stop. Now, why would you want to do that on a quad? Um, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. At all. Ever. So the again, that is useful for things like um, gliders, right? Hot, hot liners and stuff where they, where they have folding props. Foldable props. So they want, when they stop that, they want that motor to stop spinning immediately. Because a spinning, a freewheeling prop is drag and gliders right. don't want drag. Correct. And that lets the prop fold up. I will tell you this, though. I do know some people who run this on quads because they like the fact that when they disarm, the motors just go boom. Yeah. Well, they and think it used it's to be cool. on. It used to be on in yeah. the, the old BL Heli days. You couldn't turn it off. Um, and KISS never had it on ever. So, yeah. like, when you when you break to zero on a KISS, 
ESC, it just freewheels down. Yeah. So when you cut the throttle completely, they just glide yeah. down. Now, um, don't, don't get confused, though. If you're armed, the props are not going to stop. Right. This is only when you disarm. When you go to full zero. On yeah. The, on the, and and, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and on, on, on your drone, the flight controller will never allow it to yeah. go to full zero. So this is normally off. And when you stop, basically your motors stop from friction and drag. Right. But if you think it's kind of cool that when you <laughs> disarm, your motors just go stop, then you can turn yep. this on. Yep. There's, but but mostly it's for glider pilots. Yeah. Okay. And the, the tunability in particular is for glider pilots as far as how fast it stops. I need to say that that sound you heard was my sh shoes grinding <laughs> together because I don't know if I'm going to be able to cut that out and people are going to comment. That was my shoes. My you could have just blamed it on shoes. me. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're almost done here. Startup beep volume. Sure. So that, that just one. controls the... Do, like, do, do, right. do, or in my case, right. the power up. You turn, so if you turn, you turn it up, up too high, high you'll fly, fry your motor. Okay, so don't turn it up too high, you'll right. fry your motors. <laughs> I've seen it happen. Like okay. somebody accidentally janked it all the way up. They plugged in, and poosh, <laughs> motor smoked. Okay. Oh. Beacon volume. That is when you, 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 a lot of people may have not experienced this. If you leave your battery plugged in and your motors, your ESCs doesn't see throttle signal from the flight controller in a mm -hmm. while, then it'll start beeping because it thinks you lost your right. quad crash in the grass and it's trying to Correct. help you find your quad. Now that's not triggering now because we're connected to VL Heli Suite. Right. Like it only right. triggers if it's receiving normal PWM signal and yeah. then doesn't. And so that, it has to actually receive that and go through the initialization sequence first okay. or it won't trigger. And that's set to 80. So presume, and that doesn't smoke motors. It, there was a time when it smoked motors, but they changed the way the phases mm -hmm. are driven. Right, right. And now it doesn't. Right. So presumably if you wanted to, you could turn this right. up to 80. Yeah safely yep. um turning this up louder will make the quad beep louder but also more likely to smoke motors mm -hmm. be careful with this because this is going to be happening when you've crashed in the grass somewhere and, and you can't find your quad blocked, yeah and it's going to be beeping and beeping and beeping until you find it if you smoke a motor don't forget that you might not just smoke a motor but you might start a freaking forest fire <laughs> so don't turn this uh, too high yeah and smoke motors so beacon. and that beacon delay is how long it takes before it starts beeping i usually turn it down to about two minutes i usually turn it i usually turn it up to the max or off. I turn it yeah, off because yeah. uh, I... Uh, it saved always, me a couple of times. So. I have I have D-Shot motor be be beeper. Oh, see, so I as know. long as I haven't fail-safed, I can pull a button. Mm -hmm. I can pull a, a switch and, on my yeah, transmitter yeah. and make the motors beep. And it's so annoying when I'm working on the bench and they start beeping right. at me. Yeah, I always turn it off until I'm finished. And then so you can turn it up to an hour or down to 10 minutes. You can set it however you want. I set it for two for my, me personally, but like I said, it saved me three or four yeah. times. And I don't have I don't have a beeper or the D-Shot beeper set up on my quads. So I just got done, a done D-Shot so. beeper will save you. <laughs> and the thing is, if you've if you've disconnected the battery, you're not going to be beeping anyway. So right. it doesn't matter. Exactly. And have we done it? I think that's it. Is that everything? Oh, We've one hundred percent explained. The oh, uh, Heli thirty-two. There's one more throttle cal enable. Oh, what's that? Uh, so oh, yeah, if you yeah. uncheck that, uh, the calibration sequence you can't, won't work. You can't do an analog. Now, and that's really important to know because if you did accidentally uncheck it and you go to try to calibrate your motors and you jack the thing up and turn them on, it oh, just goes you're in trouble. Yeah. What does it break anything? Does it? Well, it's just I mean they go full throttle like as soon as you. No, 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 no. no. I don't think so. With all due respect, it goes do 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 do. And it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't initialize but the it throttle. But it can race. go full throttle if, depending on where okay. in the plug-in cycle. Okay, you don't, yeah. The, the reason you would turn this off, there's no, if you're using D-Shot, it yes. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So you could turn it off, turn it on. Oh, it this one died. I can't believe it. Well, you could cut that last part out anyway. <laughs> I can't believe it. That battery must not have been fully charged. Well, uh, well we're going to have to finish this video. Well, good thing we're almost done. All right, that's it. That is BL Heli 32, 100% explained. I've been Joshua Bardwell. Ryan Harrell. Happy flying.